Well, good evening, folks. It's seven o'clock in, uh, well, actually, it's seven o'clock in northern Maine, but I have a feeling Lauren is eight o'clock in yeah. Nova Scotia. That's my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted to welcome you all to this, uh, this class, which is, which is one of the, the last classes that senior college is offering this term. Um, we have uh, two more classes. We have the next one is writing your own obituary. And uh, the last one is going to be uh, uh, a snowshoeing uh, hike class um, fun trip uh, at the Fort Kent Outdoor Center in, uh, in December. But tonight we have a real special class and special on many levels. Um, it certainly is a... Uh, um, Technology here with people all over the country and actually in more than one country are participating, but it's also uh, somebody from the Valley who is now in Nova Scotia and, and has, has a lot to offer because of his experiences since leaving um, the, uh, the St. John Valley. A little about Lauren Gee. Um, Lauren is... Um, Born and raised in Fort Kent and certainly uh, attended Fort Kent, uh, the community high school, graduated from there, and all this time was a basketball star. Went to the University of Maine at Fort Kent, became a basketball star. And then, then he graduates and then gets a teaching job. And the teaching job, as part of it, he gets married, marries a teacher and they decide to go to the Northwest Territories, which when you look at the map, it's next to the Arctic Circle. And, and that's where he was for about 15 years. And during that time, and what, that's what we're gonna be seeing tonight, is his experiences up by the Arctic Circle in the Northwest, uh, Northwest Territories. After 15 years, was it about five years ago, four years ago, he returned to Nova Scotia, him and his wife, and uh, now is uh, the principal at a school. And uh, while he was up in the Northwest Territories, he did two things. He was a teacher, became principal, and then a teaching principal, and uh, quite a career in education. And so without any more, Lauren, um, Great class tonight, good participation, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Don. Uh, that's a wonderful introduction, and uh, I appreciate uh, the kind words. And um, I'm, it's really special to be uh, you know, here talking this evening, and especially with so much family on. And I can't see everybody right now because I'm presenting my screen, but uh, uh, it's certainly nice to have everybody on, and it's... Uh, it's really a pleasure to do this. Thanks again. Um, you know, whenever I would call home on the weekends and talk to mom and dad and, you know, it, mom and dad would, would talk about, you know, how the weather is and how um, things are going with uh, dad, especially with the sports at UMFK and how things were going with that. But this, the senior college was always something that was, you know, mentioned in, in our conversations. And so uh, it's a privilege to be asked to do this a second time. Uh, this time virtually, and uh, uh, you know, I hope I hope to do it justice tonight. And um, one of the things that I will say is um, that I I can't see you folks. So if at any point if you have any questions or what have you, uh, Don will either let me know and and I'll stop and try and answer them. Um, but I have some some quick presentations tonight, and I will allow for some obviously for lots of questions and answers afterwards. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to tonight. So thanks again. So when we moved to the Northwest Territories, I could tell you a, a ton of stories, but uh, when we moved to the Northwest Territories, um, we certainly didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. We were we had been teaching in Ellsworth uh, for four years and uh, the opportunity came up and, and for us to decide to make that move, it was, it was something that was uh, important for us to do. Um, for, for many reasons, we wanted to get back to Canada, which is where my wife is from. And, you know, I 
kind of twisted her arm a bit. And I said, let's not go back to Atlantic Canada right away. Let's, let's look about doing something that is, uh, adventuresome and yeah and she came along for the ride so uh that first year was a steep learning curve for for myself and my wife and it really was going to be a two or three year plan and it ended up being 15 years so um it was it was uh we, we obviously fell in love with the place and and met some amazing people along the way so uh in the time that I spent in the schools and got to know some of the indigenous uh, elders and some of the people in the community, um, one of the activities that we would do when we would go um, and experience this with uh, being out on the land or learning uh, from the people in the school or from the students was um, that because the indigenous um, yeah, yeah. culture was never uh, a written culture or never was written. They didn't, they didn't have family trees. They didn't have things like that. So whenever there was a large gathering, they would get people together and they would say, who are you? And so that when they would start all of their gatherings, people would be in a circle and they would just go around and they would introduce themselves and they would talk about who their ancestors were. So I thought I'd do a little bit of that tonight. Um, my, my grandparents on my, my father's side were Norman Gee and uh, Margaret uh, Butat, and they, I remember them as only living in Fort Kent on Pleasant Street. Uh, the Tardy family, as you know, uh, have a history in, um, in Winterville, and uh, Lionel Tardy was my grandfather, and Lorette Mador was uh, my grandmother on the Tardy side, and uh, you know, my parents, uh, Ronald Gee, who he always said he grew up in Fort Kent, which is where he spent most of his time. And, and of course, Elizabeth, who's on tonight, uh, my mom uh, is from um, Winterville. And this was the way that when, when people would gather, that they would express who they were, so that if there was some sort of a connection somehow, that people would, would be able to, that would resonate with people and they would be able to connect with family better. Um, and so here's just a picture of uh, uh, mom and dad with um, some of their grandchildren. I think this was mom's birthday probably three years ago. And um, you can see Isabel on the far left, who is um, my brother Nathan's um, child. And right next to my mom, the smaller boy is uh, Nathan's son, uh, Nathan and Jennifer's son, Ethan. And then my three, uh, Jenna is the uh, oldest girl. Shannon, who's standing in the back, is my middle child. And Connor, well, he's right there sneaking in behind Pip Hair. So uh, those are my kids. And uh, a lot of our friends and a lot of our family. And obviously, it was mixed emotions because... They were excited for our adventure, but also a little bit um, wondering, you know, like, are we going to see them again or how often are we going to see them again? And uh, so learned a lot of wonderful lessons from my grandfather, Lionel. And one of the things that I distinctly remember was the conversation that I had with him when I explained that we were moving to the NWT. And um, I said, well, you know, my wife and I are moving to the north and we're going to be teachers and uh, up there. And he said, he, he was very inquisitive. He asked me a lot of questions like uh, what's the weather like up there? And uh, you know, do people hunt and fish and trap and all that stuff? And I said, yeah. And to be honest with you, I really didn't know very much uh, uh, about what I was going to be getting myself into as well. But uh, and, you know, obviously I learned a lot those first couple of years and, and never looked back. But I remember distinctly my, my grandfather saying to me, Lauren, doesn't matter where you're going and what you've been tasked to do, but um, you will learn more from the people that you Yeah. And um, senior college in Fort Kent. We can hear you, Rochelle. Just so oh, you know. sorry. I was just showing the. I was just showing your uh, yeah. nephew. Yeah, it's okay. I'll I'll fix you again. Um, and then um, so as that you know 
story went through and my grandfather said, you know, you're going to learn more from these people than they'll ever learn from you. I, I really, on the outside, I was like, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. But on the inside, I was like, you know, way on prepare. Like I'm, I'm the teacher. I'm the one going to the North. That's my job. And I, so many times I look back on that conversation and I really wish I would have understood what he was trying to say to me mm -hmm. because that first year was a very trying year for me. I had to get used to so many different things and so many, there were so many challenges that were faced that my wife and I faced. And the biggest part of it was I wasn't feeling like I was integrating myself with the local culture and the people. And I always look back at that conversation with my grandfather as you know, I told you so, Lauren. And from that, after that first year, it really, it started to click for me. And it was because I, I started to learn more from the people that were there. So one of the first things that uh, when I became an administrator was that uh, I always kind of adhered to the understanding that education is not a place, that it's a process. And that it was really important that we focus on what's the process of education and why is it important to people. And with all the research that I've done recently, um, especially recently, I've found that that is not necessarily the case. That um, for Indigenous people, it's more about it's more about the place than it is about the the learning. And it, there's been so many situations where I've actually, um, you know, had to come to grips with that, you know, personally and, and understand that. And, you know, if you, for many of the learners that that traditional knowledge and that understanding really does take place in the natural environment. And so often I found it with the students that I was working with that, you know, they really didn't enjoy coming to school very much but as soon as you told them that they were going out to their cot, their cabin out in the bush, or if they were going somewhere with local elders, then, um, you know, their eyes would light right up. And I don't know how many times I got to go out on the land with the students and I was learning so much from them because they had that confidence in where they were and that they were able to share that traditional knowledge with me. So, so often you would hear from the students, hey, Mr. Gee, I'll, I'll see you on Monday. I'm, I'm going OTL, meaning I'm going out on the land and I'm getting to spend some time with my family. I'm going out in the bush. And I was very privileged when they would offer to take me with them. So we focus quite a bit at our school on culture-based education and how it created a partnership between the school and the community. Uh, we fostered a lot of... Uh, the connection to the place once again, just being outside and, and doing some wonderful activities with the students. Um, you can see some of the other benefits there. It boosted their achievement. It helped the students to learn. It invited students to become more active citizens and energized the teachers if, if they were taking teachers out on the land. Um, that was a great experience for the teachers as well because it once again gave the students the opportunities to be uh, who were the knowledge keepers, really, um, to teach us as well. And once again, it focused on the students. Um, so one of the things that we really worked on at our school was understanding that our students had to walk in two worlds. They had to work, walk in their cultural world, their Aboriginal world, but also in the world of um, school the way, you know, that's Eurocentric view of school. So we did a lot of things to try and connect the two worlds together. We, we fostered an on-land program at our school where we actually had a school cabin. Uh, we had six canoes with toboggans that we would take the kids out. Uh, we had a school boat um, that we accessed uh, for at least one month during the school year. We had more fishing, trapping, and hunting equipment than you can ever imagine. Um, our students were allowed to use chainsaws and axes and, and even the younger kids would take sleds out. We did something that I'll talk about a little bit later. We created a Northern Games Denny Games Summit, which brought 
a lot of our local schools together with an opportunity to participate in Indigenous games. We held a lot of elder teas, which was basically inviting um, elder, uh, elderly uh, Indigenous people that were local to the area into the school and allowing them to mingle in the classrooms with the students. And those were fantastic days at our school. We did a lot of drum dancing. Uh, people would come into the school and teach our students how to drum dance. And you could hear it in the hallways. It was just what a wonderful resonating sound. We even had programs like uh, the Wood for Elders program where we would take students out and um, go cut down lots of driftwood, but we cut wood and put them in toboggans and we would drive them right to an elder's house and drop it off in their yard. And there was no cost to it or what have you, but it was a great connection for the students um, and the community. And it was school-based. So I'll just tell you a couple of trips that we took with uh, our students. And I don't, I'm sure you can see the pictures here. Um, on this school fishing trip, um, I organized the trip and the driver of the boat in the back there is our uh, custodian. Um, so we took 12 students, all boys. And the reason we took all boys just on this trip was because we didn't have the facilities to, um, to have two, two cabins. We all had to stay in one. We used, uh, we rented two boats for this trip. And our guide once again was our school custodian. Uh, and I was the, the trip organizer, the cook, the fire starter, the cleanup crew and everything else. So I was quite busy, but it was a wonderful, <laughs> enjoyable trip. Um, one of the things that we had to really work on was uh, making sure that we were being safe and, you know, we did the life jackets and the first aid kits and, um, you know, having cell phones as well and, and just bringing some warm clothes with us. Uh, I mentioned the warm clothes. I don't know if you can see this young man, um, you know, as many notes as you send home with families and say, hey, make sure your kids bring, bring warm gear. This, this young man, um, He's, he's only about five foot nothing. And uh, it, it's funny because uh, he didn't bring long johns. And so he's wearing my long johns and I'm six foot six. So you can see them covering his toes now. It's, it was kind of a, a funny uh, situation. Whenever we would take the kids out, uh, we would do lots of planning as well. And the and students were a big part of, you know, the budgeting to, you know, to take the, uh, the, uh, the trips out and things like that. So the students were always a big part of the planning of the trip. And when we would get out there, it was, you know, the, you had the, the water and the land and the, and the sky, and it was just a wonderful combination. Um, you could drive by any one of these uh, landscapes at different times during the year and see different colors at any time. And it was, to me, it was just a magical, magical place. Um, and I've, I've seen a few places that are quite uh, um, picturesque. And uh, I'd, I'd go back to the Beaufort Delta anytime to, uh, because the, the, the outdoors is just uh, spectacular. Uh, when we were on these trips, especially this fishing trip, we ran into a uh, it really is the land of a thousand lakes and it, there's more than that. Um, but because of so many lakes, you have tremendous number of tributaries as well. Uh, so lots of streams and brooks and, and rivers. And I think every stream or every brook um, would have a, a beaver dam or a beaver uh, hut somewhere. And it kind of made traveling a bit of a challenge. There was a, lots of times we we're having to portage the boats uh, over each of these uh, dams as we went along. Uh, of course, we did some fishing, and um, here's the uh, the uh, our guide, our custodian on the left here, and one of the boys um, as well fishing in one of the tributaries. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the animals that we um, we got to enjoy in the north, and this was a losh, um, also known as a a burbot. Uh, I know there's a French way to pronounce it, but I'm, I'm going to resist. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, we, uh, this is just a, a small one. And 
this is one of our students here and he was a bit of a daredevil and uh, he found a, a fish on the side of the, um, the stream oh. and uh, one of the other students uh, dared him to eat it and wouldn't you know he for twenty dollars he put the whole thing in his belly so <laughs> it was quite uh, quite a fun uh, day we just stopped on the side of the uh, on the lake there to have uh, on, on the side of the river to have some tea and this young man wanted to have a fish I guess we did catch a release and this fish here on the right hand side this is a northern pike uh, also called a jackfish and um, the local elders uh, and the local uh, community they don't like jackfish very much because they have an extra layer or an extra row of um, bones in their back along their spines and it makes it for very hard fill it, filling to do so a lot of times when they would catch jackfish, um, the locals would throw them on the beach and just let them die, or they would catch and release. And they'd try for trouts and other types that I'll talk a little bit about later. And once again, the Northern Pike uh, locally was known as the jackfish. And this child's ready to, this student's ready to send it back. So. Mm. In 2014, we were fortunate to get some funding and go on a moose hunt uh, with all the students. Mm -hmm. And this time we used the school boat. Um, this time we took nine students and we had three girls and six boys. And once again, because we had the, the cabin space uh, available, we could take some girls with us. Uh, once again, I, was the, uh, I wasn't the guy, but it was a local elder and guide. His name is Jimmy Klenick, uh, became a good friend of mine. And... Um, He's First Nations, he's Aboriginal, and when I, when I would go on trips like this, um, I was the only one, I, I could carry a rifle because I had the, uh, the license for it, but I wasn't allowed to shoot because there was someone who was Indigenous that was with me. And the, the, the rule is, or the, the law is that if someone who is Indigenous is, is hunting with you, um, they have the first um, priority. And so once again, I was doing everything um, to support that trip as well. You could see all the, uh, the jerry cans there in the front of the boat. Uh, we probably went through um, on this trip. I think we drove our boats for about three days oh, wow. before we found, a, we found a moose, which is very uncommon. Usually you could find one in a, at least the first two days, but they weren't uh, plentiful and where we were. So we went through a lot of gas and we probably filled up about 20 or 25 of those jerry cans that you see there um, just to get us around the Beaufort Delta region. So on day three, we did see our moose. And um, if you can see, these are the actual pictures. Um, we came across two bulls, a, a cow and two calves. And um, one of the bulls was obviously older and and a little bit bigger so i'll tell you a little bit about um that that kill and i've never seen anything like it the um all four or five of the moose were only in about three feet of water and um when we kind of circled the boats around um the biggest bull moose recognized that uh things were happening and he stopped and got in between the other four and our boats. And I'll, you wouldn't believe that until you saw it, but the, the bull almost turned to the other four and grunted as if to say, go away, I've got this, I'm gonna handle this. And then turned and stared at the, the boat that, the, um, that Jimmy was in and he had his rifle. And, um, it, it was just an amazing situation for me to see because that bull was ready to charge, but he was making sure that the family was going to get away before he did that. And sure enough, the, the, uh, the rest of the uh, moose were able to get away and get on land and, and run a little bit faster. And then when he saw they were away safely enough, he turned to the, to the, um, to the other boat and tried to charge. And that's, that's when he took them down. So you can't see it very well in this picture, but in this picture you can. Um, we shot the, the bull in um, 
a little bit of water. He was able to, to hook it up to the boat. And then we humped it onto the, the land. And what you'll see now is all the students got involved right from the beginning. They helped us with the harvest. And um, like I said, they started bringing the moose up on the land with us. And right, you know, many of these children would have been exposed to this years ago uh, when they were younger as well. And just kind of, um, there's the girls taking some pictures um, and harvesting. And we brought everything back with us um, in the indigenous, uh, with, within the indigenous um, philosophy or their ways, um, every part of the, um, the moose is used. And so we brought it back to the school. Um, the classrooms were actually cleaning. Uh, we brought the, the, uh, the fur back to be used for some artwork that uh, some of the classrooms were doing. Uh, all the organs, everything was saved, and some was delivered to local elders in the community. And they had a feast for us when we came back, which was another tradition that, uh, that would typically happen. Um, and it was really great. It was great to be honored, and it was a real honor for me to be part of this with the students and, uh, and come home. And there's some of, uh, there's my boy Josh. He was pretty excited about it. And so was I, as you can see. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I'm wearing my old my old UMFK jacket, one that I probably would have graduated with. Um, so UMFK got to go on this trip as well. So that was the first part of my presentation. And uh, I'm going to uh, get out of uh, this mode here and open up. my screen. I think I can do that. And just open it up and see if you have any questions for me about that part of it. Yeah, for those who, yeah, for those, for those who have uh, questions, you can, uh, you'll have to uh, unmute yourselves because right now, most everybody is muted. Just unmute and ask the question. Yeah. Uh, in the Northwest Territory, you have a lot of, as long as it's very similar to the Yukon, you have a lot of months of darkness and light. And how much did that affect you? And mm -hmm. is there that much difference in the lightness and dark in the Northwest versus the Yukon? Very good question. Um, so one of the things when I talked about struggling, you know, in my just struggling in all facets of my life, I guess that first year that I lived there, I think the biggest part of what I was experiencing was the seasonal effectiveness disorder, um, which and, and I, one of the slides that I show in the next presentation um, talks about the climate and we had I think it was almost a month and a half of total darkness and a month and a half or two months of full sunlight. Um, so it was definitely the land of the extremes, uh, not to mention you had anywhere from, you know, 40 degrees below zero to, you know, like 90 degrees Fahrenheit on really, really hot days. Um, it was definitely the land of extremes. So, uh, the Yukon, as many people might know, is uh, neighbors the Northwest Territories, um, and it, uh, the climate is very, very similar. The the if you know parts of it are above the Arctic Circle as well, and yeah, that um, that lack of sunlight was probably that first year was probably the one of the most difficult things I ever had to go through, and um, you know. <laughs> I, I don't drink a lot of alcohol. That was a lot of people's go-to <laughs> uh, to deal with that. But I, I chose to do things like, you know, use the sad lamps, uh, take more vitamin C pills. Uh, I worked out a lot more. Um, I took naps uh, frequently, you know, to try and uh, drink lots of water. Those were all things that I, I really had to start doing because 
my body was telling me that um, uh, that was that was a change. That was a something that was uh, that I had to adjust to. Right, and and I guess I asked that because I've spent a few summers in the Yukon, and it, the light was gorgeous, but. I'm not sure I would have wanted to be there in in the middle of winter because that's got to be challenging. Yeah. So in the summertime, you 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 could tell the people who weren't local because what they would do, and I think I did this my first year, but after that, I, I really got used to it. Uh, a lot of people would put tin foil in their windows of their of their bedroom um, because that simulated, you know, it's it's dark outside and I I can get to sleep. Uh, what I loved about the summertime in May and June when I was there was all the vitamin C, you know, I could, I could go weeks with just getting four hours of sleep and working out every day. And, and my workouts were amazing. I just, I felt so energized, um, almost too much because you know, you're sleep deprived, but you still feel great. And, um, Lots of people with, you know, had, were definitely on both sides of that. They, they either said, no, I, I really enjoy uh, the darkness and I like getting that extra little bit of sleep and my life can slow down a little bit. Uh, I was definitely on the other end. I, I love the, I didn't like the darkness. I really liked being in the light and, and getting less sleep and, and being able to do more with my day. Great questions. Lauren? Yes. Were uh, any, any of the teachers from the Northwest Territories? Yep. So great question. We had um, our student body was 80% Aboriginal and about 20% non-Aboriginal. But the teaching staff was flip-flop. Um, we were about 90% non-Indigenous as a teaching staff and about 10% Indigenous and typically the the people who were uh, had positions like language teachers or lower elementary teachers. It wasn't uh, it, there were a few that did work at the high school level, but not as many. All right, I'm just going to go to the next one. Can you, Don, can you see what I'm showing now? Right now, it's uh, the questions. It's a slide oh, of the, okay. uh, the end Sorry. slide. Yeah, I'm going to do a new share here. There we go. Can you see the country foods one? Yeah. Yes, it okay. just came on. All mm -hmm. right. Whenever I get homesick, I, I cook food that I grew up with. Um, I consider my mom and my, um, my grandmother's amazing cooks and uh, my grandparent, my grandmothers were, were uh, quite different with their cooking, um, but uh, just amazing as well. And I have some wonderful recipes that are in a cookbook that I have. And whenever I would... Um, others and say, I messed up your bread. Can you explain to me what I did wrong? And uh, <laughs> they would help me with that. Uh, and many times, uh, you know, uh, mom and I have talked about certain foods that uh, we like to cook. And uh, obviously, when I would come home in the summers, I always made um, an effort to do the bean hole beans, which is something that my, uh, my grandfather, Lionel, um, did. In the Beaufort Delta region, there were two distinct um, Aboriginal groups. There was the Inuvialuit and the um, Gwich'in people. So where we lived in the Beaufort Delta region was Inuvialuit land, and they would speak the Inuvialuit language. And these are the descendants of the Inuit people. Um, you would never use the term or you shouldn't use the term Eskimos today, but that's where they had originated. Yes. Um, also the Gwich'in land was the people of the Dene region. Um, they spoke the Dene language 
and these are descendants of the Dene people, um, two distinct groups, but who share uh, land rights in the Beaufort Delta region. And I got to know um, their people quite well. And I know these are uh, these are clips from um, uh, Google, but uh, these were very common uh, sightings that I would see on my travels when I would travel up north. It's very, very picturesque. And uh, you, in the fall time, you would see all the colors. You would see the whites on the top of the mountains and the blacks on the top of the mountains, but you'd see purple flowers and green flowers and, and yellows. And it was just, it really was a rainbow um, whenever we were driving these roads. So they would, uh, the locals would talk about um, their Northern food as being country food and the food. So, so when I talk tonight, I'm talking a little bit about the his, the history of their food and um, how they would collect it or how they would hunt um, and this was based specifically on seasonal patterns. And so a lot of what um, uh, they would uh, enjoy for food was totally based on the climate um, and their travel, how they were able to travel and their resources. And um, so if you... Uh, towns or the villages and these villages were based on what kind of hunting ground or where they were able to find food and so because both of these um, indigenous groups were semi-nomadic um, they were able to move around and they were able to find food this is where their communities had been established so once again, the climate conditions in January and February, um, we would see a typical weather of somewhere between 15 degrees, minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit to 30 degrees below zero. And in June um, and July, those were the hottest months. It would be, you know, usually around 45 or 65, but with the extreme being about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, August was always the wettest month. Every time we would come home to Inuvik from our summers, people would, I'd say, how was your summer to the locals? And they say, oh, it's terrible. August was just so wet. And I'd be like, well, it's wet every year, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, so we always had a good laugh over that. Uh, February was by far the driest month. They would get very, very little mm -hmm. snow anyway, but February was always the driest month. Um, we would experience 24 hours of daylight from the middle of May up until uh, July the 4th. And then uh, it would be 24 hours of darkness, December 8th um, to January 6th. And my joke in the summertime um, was, uh, you know, I'd say to Paula, I'm, I'm going out with uh, my friends tonight. And she'd say, well, when are you coming home? I said, well, when it gets dark. Um, so sometimes I was staying out for a couple of days. Um, so when everything in the indigenous culture that I experienced while we were up north was based, the seasons uh, were based on, uh, so the, the calendar was based on the seasons. So the word for January in their language was basically um, that this is the month that we're trapping Arctic hare. Um, so everything was based on a, once again, a season. So when we talked about years when settlements came in and, and non-Indigenous people came in, um, this was the lifestyle that people led. So in January, they were trapping uh, mostly rabbits. In February, they were hunting moose, caribou, and mountain sheep. They were also trapping smaller animals uh, for, just for the fur because they had established a, a fur trade as well. March was the ice fishing month. And April and May, they were hunting birds and geese uh, and ducks. 
they trapped animals such as muskrats and beavers, um, and they also collected eggs towards the uh, later part of May. I remember a couple of elders telling me that, you know, their job when they were a child was to go out and get eggs um, out on the tundra. And their fathers would tell them, be, or their mothers would tell them distinctly, you know, for every nest that you go to, if there's three, you're only taking one. If there's two, you're only taking one. They wanted to make sure that the, the next generation of birds, um, that there was at least some that was left behind. So you couldn't steal eggs, I guess, from, from all of the nests. Um, once again, in June, this was called the drying month, where they would take fish and moose and caribou and, and ducks, and they would um, fillet the meat. They would um, harvest the meat and they would spend time drying it because once again, in June, you can dry a lot of things when you have 24 hours of sunlight. In July and December, they were harvesting plants and roots and also um, they were moving to the whaling uh, camps because mm -hmm. now, by now, the, um, the ice flows had gone through and um, they had access to years ago it would have been their kayaks but um at this time you know uh, since settlements have happened you know we have the motorized boats now um in august they continued to dry meats and continued to do some whaling once again um i'll talk a little bit about that in a second in september they did a lot of berry picking and once again they did a lot of traveling to do the things that we're that i'm describing right now um, cranberries and cloudberries were their most common types of, um, of uh, plants that they would uh, harvest. In October and November, once again, they started hunting uh, larger game. Um, and the thing about October and November uh, is the, in the fall time, you start to lose the leaves. And this really allowed for um, the hunters to do quite better because the animals didn't have the foliage to hide behind. So they were much more successful, they felt, in October and November than they were at any other times during the year. And once again in December, they would start ice fishing, fight ice fishing again. So what did they hunt? And um, so I have a list here. And in this list, I've highlighted in red the ones that I have eaten in my time. So I'm going to show you about four or five slides and I'll tell you what some of my favorite ones are, but um, I have eaten a uh, beluga whale and that's usually eaten raw. And yeah. I was really scared to, to try that for the first time. Um, and, uh, but some of the local elders started to prepare it a little bit differently by boiling it for, for me. And I, I tried it for the first time, I think just about, the time we were about to leave and it was really good they call it locally they call it muck tuck um canadian geese is a very popular uh, uh, bird up there obviously and uh i had some students in one of my classes um say i, I said you know i haven't had goose before uh, up here and my student said i'll get you some mr geese so she for that math class we did a um just a basic cooking thing where we um, we we tried a couple of different ingredients and and did some measuring and I said okay she said well you would put it in a pan and you would roast it uh, on the fire but we'll do it in the oven and um she just put an inch of water in it and there were no seasonings, nothing. And Canadian geese um, are very fat uh, because mm. they make that trip and um, they need that energy. And I'll tell you, I've never had a, a bird more tasty than that goose. That was nice. Caribou is the, the lifeblood of the, uh, the Dene people. And they, they, they talk quite a bit about um, the importance of caribou. Um, we also had some reindeer herds up there um, that are um, caribou, yes, but these are um, herds that are managed and um, made to be migratory 
Um, and that is all done by herders. So there's a few groups that actually still do that up north. Yeah. I, I haven't eaten brown bear. I haven't eaten grizzly and polar bear, but those are all um, options for people to eat up there. Um, polar bear was much further north than we were. Um, and you had to be of a certain stature to be able to, to hunt a polar bear. And moose is very popular, and as you saw in my, my first video. Um, what else did they hunt? Uh, I really liked the Arctic hare, the spruce grouse, um, ptarmigan, and the geese. And like I said, I, I highlighted those because they were some of my favorites. Um, water ducks were also a popular um, hunting bird up north. Swans were considered or still are considered the queen's bird. And swans up north are very plentiful, but they are not, you're not allowed to hunt them because once again, they're considered the queen's bird and they're, um, uh, they're in danger. Just a quick question. Sure. You had talked about uh, all the different hunting seasons and, and you, you had basically every month labeled there. Are those hunting seasons only for indigenous people yeah. or are they for whoever is there? So, so what would happen is you were allowed to, uh, because I became a resident, it took me three years to be able to do, to actually get a hunting license. Um, and you have to be able to prove residency unless you are uh, affiliated with a local guide who is indigenous. And so they would actually, you know, people would come from the South and because they were working with a certain guide, they were allowed um, to hunt for a week or a weekend or, you know, however they were able, long with they, they were able to get their license, but they had to show proof of their uh, firearm safety. Places to get that special license that you needed. Uh, but for myself, uh, I was, you know, it took me three years to be able to have that status where I could go out on my own and I didn't have to worry about uh, someone who was Indigenous being with me. Good question. They also did uh, a fair bit of trapping. And uh, once again, the Arctic hare was something that... Um, um, I got a chance to eat. I also got a chance to eat muskrat and, um, I've shown a couple pictures here of a muskrat there. But the, the locals really like the tails. Um, the tails are similar to like a, a beaver tails, uh, consistency, if you will, but they would, um, they would fry up the tail and um, you could take the skin off and then there would be a meat inside there. And uh, I, I enjoyed the hindquarters. I enjoyed um, parts of the back and the... Um, ...tail, it was just something that I, I struggled with. Um, but they would hunt, they would trap all these other animals and... Um, they had an opportunity to sell the furs for, um, you know, a, a fox, sorry, um, a wolf pelt could fetch a fair bit of money. It was like maybe $200 or something like that if it was done properly. Um, and then the resale of that would be quite, quite a bit more than that as well. I really, you know, I, I, I had the opportunity to fish a lot with my uncle and my, my grandfather and, Whenever I would go up north, I, I got to do that quite a bit with my friends as well. Uh, I enjoy the lake trout, the inconus, uh, the northern pike as well, the jackfish, the arctic char. Um, I have never tried lake whitefish. Um, I, I've in, I didn't fish for salmon, but um, I had the opportunity, obviously, to eat it. Cisco's are very small fish, um, very similar to the smelts that we would have in uh, northern Maine, um, and I enjoyed those as well. Grayling was something that uh, a lot of people like to fish. Um, and, of course, the Barbut and the, the Lausch were things that uh, 
people uh, like to eat a lot. So I'm going to tell you a quick fishing story. I'm half tardy, so I'm going to tell you a <laughs> quick fishing story. And um, it really doesn't involve me. Um, it involves a good friend of mine, and it, but it's a story that I've told numerous times, and I'm pretty sure there's no embellishment with it. So um, my friend, uh, good friend of mine, he's a superintendent in Calgary now, and um, he, I wasn't able to go on this fishing trip, but they went out on snowmobile, and they were able to um, get the um, uh, skidoos going around in a circle, and um, they were able to take the auger out. This was this was ice fishing, and they drilled their holes, and they started um, putting their uh, lines in the water, and they started, they call it jiggling up north. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes... different um jiggling is what you do when you go fishing and so they were out there for an hour and they were only in like three or four feet of water and they had the the augers are quite big because the ice is so thick and they were jiggling for an hour and finally some of the guys said listen there's no fish here there's nothing you know we're not going to be able to get anything today here so my friend chris um he's one of the most patient people I know was kept that, uh, line moving. And, and, um, anyway, while everyone else is packing up, he strikes a fish and it happens to be a very, very large fish. And I'm talking like 30 or 35 pounds. Um, it was so big. So he, he pulls on it and recognizes that he has a fish they're only in two or three feet of water. He doesn't have to pull very far before he sees the mouth of the fish. He throws his jiggling stick to the side. He grabs the fish by the mouth and he starts to pull it up through the hole. It got stuck in the hole. That's how big this fish was. And so he says, well, I'll just leave it there. And, uh, and he pulls out the pliers and he now can get the, uh, the lure out of the fish's mouth and, the, the fish is stuck. It can't, can't move. So then, you know, while all this is going on, he turns around and he was back out and threw their lines back in the water and started jiggling as fast as they could, thinking that there was another fish nearby. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of a funny story in that uh, he was able to get a fish that size while, uh, and, and be patient while, uh, the rest of them were ready to jump ship and, uh, go someplace else. And then when, when they saw what he caught, they were, they were going after it as well. And so, um, the pictures were taken and, um, actually sent to my grandfather, Lionel, and he, he put it up at his house. Uh, and, uh, I, I still think he tells the story that it was me, but it yeah. wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so there's the size of the auger that we would use, um, you know, if we were out on the land and, um, that guy's about six feet tall. So the, the, the winch or the, um, the actual auger itself was, uh, you know, a good, uh, five and a half feet. And, uh, sometimes and I always like to show a couple of pictures like this because, um, transportation in the north uh, they would create the ice roads and uh, if people weren't careful and didn't go at certain times of the year when it was was safe to do so there were a lot of trucks that would um, that would break through the ice and you know we would hear stories uh, some unfortunate stories last week and uh, you know, we, we hear stories about that quite a bit. Um, you know, they obviously did some, some foraging as well. Uh, cranberries and blueberries and cloudberries were the most popular uh, berries. And I, I, if I'm showing that here, the cranberries are on the left and the cloudberries, uh, they were called Ockpix. Uh, that was the indigenous name, Ockpix. And if you look to the right there, those are the cloudberries. They also harvested uh, potato root, uh, lots of medicinal herbs. And once again, I mentioned they would forage for eggs. And 
young kids, their job quite often was, you know, if you guys are bored and you're looking for something to do, we can always use firewood, go find us some driftwood. So the kids would go out and bring driftwood back to the, to the cabins. And that was part of their job. So lots of hunting and fishing and, um, uh, things that I got to experience in the North, uh, with the Northern food. Like I said, I, I I'll end the way I started. I love food and I love cooking different types of food and I like trying different recipes. Um, but the time that I spent in the North was, it was quite amazing because I had all of these, um, items, uh, available to me. And, uh, and if I asked an elder to show me how to cook, um, they were always willing to support me and, and show me how to do certain things, uh, which I enjoyed. And if ever I could get the students involved in doing some cooking as well, that was, that was always a treat for me. So anyone have any questions? I have quite a few. Uh, were, were you For the state or for the province or for the federal? Yeah. So I worked for the territorial government, the Northwest Territories territorial government. So I was a territorial employee. Where we were in Inuvik, we were not, um, we were not granted um, public housing. There are some communities in the far north, uh, in the further north you would go, they would, in order to entice people to live there, they would give you uh, an opportunity to uh, live in, in public housing. And, um, you know, I, I don't know too much about that because we didn't have that experience, but I do know in some of the further northern settlements that uh, that was definitely an option for you. Can you hear me, Lauren? I can. Okay. Um, I noticed there weren't very many trees. What do they use for their primary source of heat? Um, so where we were in Inuvik, there were, there, we were below the tree line. Um, so yes, there were actually some trees where we were. Um, but the further north that you would go, if you were traveling to Tuck or Polatuck or Saks Harbor, you were way above the tree line. So what they would use for heat was any driftwood um, because the Mackenzie River flowed up towards the um, Arctic Ocean. And because of that, there was a lot of um, debris and logs and trees that would come down every year. And um, that was actually one of the activities that a lot of people would do is when the ice jams would go through, then all of a sudden they would, and the ice started to melt in June and July, they would go out in their boats and they would um, tie up big logs and bring them back to their homes. And then they would cut, you know, let them dry out most of the summer in the 24 hours of daylight. And then they would um, buck them up and cut them and, and uh, use them for, for heat. So your process of educating people and your grandfather said that you would learn more about them than they would learn about you, which was very true. Yeah. The, uh, the thing about living up there, the most important thing was to learn how to survive. Yeah, absolutely. To learn the seasons. I know that education is a great thing for all of us, but the most important thing for those people was to learn how to survive. Well, and, and that's, you know, that was... That was their livelihood, you know, uh, survival for them was for, for many people that lived in the North was a big part of, um, uh, of just their being, you know. And, and, yeah, go ahead. No, you no finish. Well, and, and, and that's what I, you know, I, I learned a lot of things, but, um, and, and learning as well that I was very fortunate to grow up where I, I, I did. And, um, I didn't have to live to survive. You know, I, 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 I was afforded a lot of things that uh, a lot of people, you know, even years ago, whether you lived in the Northwest territories or wherever, you know, 
it was all about survival and um, it really helped humble me and uh, helped me understand that I was very fortunate where I grew up and how I grew up. Uh, Lauren, so you, maybe I misunderstood you a while ago, but you couldn't cook food over there that you were used to here at home. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, you could Yeah, I mean, we, we had, uh, see, keep in mind that, um, like, beef was flown up uh, to all of the stores that we lived near, and uh, so we we had all of the amenities, all of the food that we wanted um, from the South. I mean, we didn't have McDonald's and Burger King and things like that. And we certainly did our fair share of that in the summers when we were home. But, um, you know, we had the roasts from a beef. We had chicken, you know, in our, in our stores and lots of produce and milk and all those things were, were made very readily available to us. They were quite expensive because, um, you know, bringing those things to the north from the south, um, you know, transport, transportation, gasoline, things are very expensive. So that cost was put on to the consumer and, you know, our, our food was quite expensive. But anytime someone offered me a, a, a side of, uh, of caribou or, or moose or something, a roast of moose, I, I wasn't going to say no, that's for sure. So one, one quick last question. Uh, you talked a lot about dehydration and it was when you had so much time in, in, of daylight in the summer, things dried very quickly. But isn't it when it gets really cold, it's much drier? So wouldn't things dry more quickly in the winter? Um, I would think so. The only thing is if, if in the wintertime, things were quite frozen as well, right? Yeah. So if, if, like, if I had put some wood away in the fall time that was wet and it froze right away, it was going to stay wet until, you know, the springtime when it would thaw out again and then it would get hit with the sun. Um, you're exactly right. The wintertime was quite dry and a storm for us up north was maybe one or two inches. That was a storm. Whereas in, you know, northern Maine, you could have, you know, a foot to a foot and a half and that would be considered a storm. Um, we, I had, we were 15 years in the north and I think I had three storm days and they were, they were twice in, in those 15 years, twice for wind. We had extreme winds, so they canceled school. And only once did we have so much snow. And I think it might have been three inches of snow that we got. They just said, no, that's way too much. We can't handle that right now. We're going to cancel school. I don't know if I answered your question, but. You did. You did. Thank you. Why was school canceled if you only had three inches of snow? Well, we didn't have public busing for the schools. So a lot of our families, some students uh, were walking, you know, a mile, mile and a half a day. Uh, well, a mile and a half to get to school. And then they had to go home for lunch. That was the other thing. We didn't have a school lunch program. So for some of our families, um, it was a mile you know, to come to school, then they would go a mile home at lunch um, and then back to school after lunch and then home at the end of the day. So that, you know, some of our students were walking about four miles a day just to have their education. So because that would have been a challenge for some of our, you know, kindergarten <coughs> students, um, you know, three, three inches was, would have been a bit much for those kids. I have a Who's question. Go ahead. Um, on your initial uh, uh, decision to move up there to go and to teach, um, did you ever expect to stay as long as you did? No. No, I, I, we really thought it was a two to four year plan. And yeah. 
here, here's the interesting thing. Um, when we started said, okay, we're, we're going to start having a family, the incentives to have a family in the North are quite, um, quite good in that um, my wife was able to get almost her full salary for a year. It was a, a year's paid maternity leave. Um, so when we would have a child, um, she could be off work for a full year collecting, I think it was 93% of her salary. The only stipulation was that if you take that bump up in pay for that year, you have to pay back a year. So when we started having children, you know, and taking the maternity leave, you were kind of roped in for two years. Right. So we, so we had three children. So that meant we had to stay in the North for six years. And <laughs> then um, my wife also got a uh, education leave at one stage during our tenure. And the stipulation there was we will pay for your education and your salary for that sc full school year but you have to pay back, meaning you have to work two more years on top of it. Right. Um, so with the benefits that we received, um, we were roped into nine years uh, in the north of the 15. Okay. And the last two um, came when, unfortunately, when my father-in-law passed away, and that was, we had, Paula had paid back her last year. And that's when we made the decision that we were going to move back to Nova Scotia. Internet access available up there? Yeah, but very spotty. I mean, everyone had the internet. Um, uh, Wi-Fi was, was kind of spotty at times, um, but we did have access to it. Yeah, absolutely. So what did your children think of, of, of going to school up there once you moved back to Nova Scotia? What was their impression? Um, well, I, I, th I think they, well, I, I don't think they knew any better. And yeah. um, I, think they, I, I just think they enjoyed themselves, you know, and they got to really experience a different culture. So that was, that was nice for them. That's good. We're going to mute you. I, I'm getting some feedback here, so it's hard yeah. to hear people. You're breaking up. Yeah. Somebody's going to mute. Breaking up. Somebody's going to mute. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. I have one last. Uh, slide to show or one last show here for you and then um, we can call it a night um, and so when I talked about indigenizing um, education and bring, bringing the culture back into the school one of the things that we created was um, our uh, it was we called it our northern games Denny Games Summit and I'll talk to you a little bit about that and then uh, we can call it a night, but I want to make sure that I can, oops, um, share screen. There we go. Can you folks see that? Yep. Yeah, we do. All right. So once again, we're, we were trying to really find ways to bring the culture from the community into the school. And so one of the things that we did was we, we developed our Northern Games and Denny Games, um, our summit. And the origin of the, the Northern and the Denny Games, um, these all originated um, by the, the local people who were uh, semi-nomadic. Uh, these games were played for fun and for survival. Um, they were used to develop strength, endurance, tolerance to pain, and resilience. Um, in many times, at many times, these games were created uh, and played as part of a celebration. They were developed, um, and you'll see that by with some of the games, um, to participate in very confined areas, in very small indoor areas, because 
heat was so important, um, their dwellings were not very big. And because of that, um, the games that they created had to be played in very small um, areas. Um, the games themselves were also modified based on gender. Um, so you'll see some of that here as well. The Northern Games, which were sometimes called the Inuit Games, there were over 200 games. And the most popular games were the one-foot high kick. I think the world record for the one-foot high kick is nine feet. And what you have to do is <clears throat> you jump with two feet, you kick the target, which was typically a seal skin uh, little pillow that was extended from a string. You kick it, and if you hit it, you have to land on the same foot that you touched the target with. Otherwise, it's not considered a, a good kick. So just to give you a little reference, a basketball hoop is 10 feet tall. And if you touch the bottom of that net, you're at about eight and a half or nine feet. And I think that's the world record. So someone jumped with two feet, kicked the basketball net with one foot, and then would have to land on that same foot. It's probably one of the most popular Northern games. The two foot high kick was a similar kick, but you had to kick with two feet so the world record, I think, for that is around five or six feet. It's a little bit lower. Uh, you can see the, uh, the same target there. And then they would have to land on two feet afterwards. The head pull was just tug of war with um, using your head. And once again, these are the Inuit games. Um, if the band that's around these contestants necks or their the backs of their head if it falls off um then you're the loser um and if you get pulled out of a certain area then um uh, you're not the winner either the winner would have had control of you mm -hmm. so that was kind of a, a neat game uh leg wrestle is exactly what it sounds like uh, it's kind of arm wrestling but with your legs and you would count you would put your hips together facing in opposite directions count to three and uh, then lock legs and whoever got turned over was the, the loser. Uh, the airplane, I don't know of a game that had more resistance um, than this one. Um, what you had to do is you had to make the iron cross basically as you were lying down and um, you would, um, uh, there would be three people, two that would uh, grab either hand and one that would grab feet and you would walk at a steady pace going around uh, an enclosed area and whoever got the farthest was considered the strongest person there. Um, once again, this could be modified. Bring your arms closer uh, together. And that was that. Any of the uh, games that or the um, competitions that we attended always ended with the knuckle hop and the knuckle hop is basically doing a push-up and hopping around the gym or a, an enclosed area and pushing with your feet and and hitting with your knuckles and they would always save this uh, towards the end of any competition because it was the most grueling and the hardest on your knuckles and there was always, you know, people there to make sure that, uh, you know, they could cover up the, the blisters or the blood or what have you afterwards. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you a, a quick demonstration of the, the knuckle hop here. <laughs> so once again um the the purpose of the game whoops there's whoops, a voice whoops, inside whoops, all of us whoops, 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 whoops. 
still there? Yeah. Uh, the purpose of the games, once again, was to build endurance and build up a tolerance so that when they really needed that for survival, that they were able to do those things. Um, once again, the Dene uh, people, the Gwich'in people, had some games as well. Um, their games, uh, the most popular, were the stick pull. And this game was actually invented um, to build up hand strength because the Dene people like to fish um, by creating pools in um, streams. And once the fish would uh, collect in these areas, they would drain the water out of it. And uh, what, the, what the people needed to do was they needed to grab the fish and then throw them on the land. Well, the fish were slippery. So they created this stick pull game and they would use animal fat on the on these pieces of dowels or these pieces of wood. And the participants would stand foot to foot and you would grab the pole and whoever could pull the pole out of the other person's hands was considered the winner. Um, so you really had to have strong hands to be able to do this. Um, the snow snake was also a competition Originally, this was um, sort of a sword that was fashioned out of a dowel of wood. And the idea was that um, they could throw this along the snow. And years ago, it would injure, it wouldn't kill, but it would injure a caribou that was lying down on the ground. Um, so they started to develop a competition um, on throwing the snow snake. And you'll see that in the quick video that I. Or um, you're the object of this game is to push your opponents outside of a, a ring. You can see the ring on the outside. So when we developed our Northern Games and Denny Games Summit, these were the games that we had the students participating in. And I'll tell you, it was such a great experience um, for me. Uh, to see this. It, we, we held this friendly competition once a year in Inuvik. Um, we focused a tremendous amount of what we were teaching the students came from the elders and um, how important the elders are in the local culture and having the elders come into the school and show the young kids um, how to participate in these games was absolutely priceless and we certainly saw a huge boost in our attendance and just some wonderful stories that came from that, uh, that time of year uh, for us. Our summit, when we did it, included an opening ceremonies, a community feast where we got to enjoy some of the country foods. Um, we did the indoor and the outdoor events that I showed you. Uh, there were awards for the athletes. We had a, a dance, closing ceremonies, and many other fun activities for the students. Um, and throughout the school year, several local elders, like I said, um, would go into the local schools and teach the kids and say, you know, when you go to Inuvik, do our community proud and, and do your best at the games. And they, <laughs> they certainly would do that. I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, this was something that we, we designed um, at our, I think it was our second annual uh, summit. Yeah. And they... Since I've left, I think they're at their 10th now. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what, was, what was great about this um, event for me was the first couple of years, I, I went to some local groups to say, can you help us with funding? Can you help us with funding? And um, because we had to fly in the students from the other communities. So that, that was expensive. So we worked on a budget, I think that first year of like $80,000, just trying to get the students to come into Inuvik and participate in the games. By our fourth year, I had these local groups calling me saying, how can we participate? How can we support you financially? And how can we get another flight uh, to these northern communities to get more kids to come down? Because, you know, we want our kids to be able to participate. Um, so, like I said, I think the first year we worked on a budget of like 80000 maybe a little bit less than that. By the time I left, we were somewhere around 200000 just for that one event. And it was 
local community that came together and said, you know, uh, we're not going to buy you a plane, but we're going to get some kids there for you to participate. And it was just an amazing event. Mm -hmm. So here it is. annual, hopefully annual, Dene and Northern Games Summit, and we have all, the, all of the communities um, taking part this year, so everybody in the Beaufort Delta region, and 111 students came in from the communities, and I think we have another 100 from Inuvik, from both schools, elementary and secondary, so we're looking, um, I don't know the exact number, but for sure close to 200 students taking part. <laughs> it's very nice to see the elders come into the school, the instructors come into the school and work with the kids. So um, the generation before teaches things to the, the youth um, of our community. This is the second year it's been held. The first year was last year, and it's just excellent with the organizers. I know Mr. D from the high school that they're off. Also um, with Matha, um, Gina Katana, and then there's several um, officials from the community to the land here, Serena Wright, and Lina and Lina Kodaka and her sister Darlene Kodaka and there's several elders and the elders not to mention, not to forget to mention the elders of um, Edward Lenny and Eva Kinia. Yeah. Yeah. Northern Games, Northern Denny Games Summit is um, helping with building capacity for the Northern Games, getting volunteers <coughs> into the games, um, getting youth. Uh, familiarized with our culture through uh, different Inuit games and it's also a, a way to build leadership through our games so bridging our past to youth of today. Karen McDonald from Inuvik. They're doing pretty well. Um, I met a lot of new friends and uh, you know we're all doing fairly well at the games. It's pretty good. Oh, wow. Northern Games and Denny Games coming together, you know, I and mean, like it's pretty cool that they actually have this meeting now every year at the East Street in our neighbors, so I think it's pretty awesome when we do that. it in the school in a gymnasium they're using part of that and a lot of the kids that use the games they they, they feel themselves doing better so they got to keep on going that's, that's what you know it don't take very much to do that just just yourself and you got to keep believing that you can keep on going and when before you get too far then you're going to pass it on to some of the younger fellows that, that's having real problems. Maybe, you know, just to go over to them and say, maybe if you try it this way, try it. See if it's easier. Because a lot of... He said, I can't. I told him, well, that's a lie. I always tell him that. 
You're lying to yourself. You don't know what you could do. And all at once they come, a few days later, they come to me and say, thanks a lot, Mr. Lenny. Boy, he said, I can do this, I can do that. There's absolutely nothing you can, nothing could stop you. That's the way, that's the way I look at it. That's the way I pass it on. And I'm glad that there's, there's people, uh, the young people took. Some of these games are very, very technical, and learning how to do that is um, is a very difficult skill for for many of our youth. But if they've mastered it, then share it and take it back to their communities. Uh, when I was going to high school here in Anubik and growing up, I we were always like wanting to get into the arc sports with the school, but then we just didn't have the time and the interest. But then it's really Amazing to see that. Like the whole high school came down to come watch the one foot high kick. Like, it's amazing. Take part in the great games, not only because they're great things to do, but try to think in your mind many, many years ago what you would have done if you had the opportunity to do that. And each one of them. You know, every one of these games were part of an action or an activity that contributed to learning and the well-being and survival. Smart choices where you end up actually... Instead of always having... Having the easy way to go about things, you know. Um, this is your culture. Um, be proud of it. Be proud of who you are. And, um, you know, be proud of much, uh, the more you get involved, uh, you know, the more uh, more people will get involved. In it, so. No, I'm just very proud to be a part of this uh, Dene and Northern Game Summit. Like I said, it's really cool to see that our cultures, both Dene and Nubialot, are very strong. And um, I'm very, very happy to be a part of that. And I hope this is something that continues to grow and get bigger every year. Swear between the end. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna lie to you i i um i'm feeling a little bit homesick for anuvik right now it was uh <laughs> it was kind of a nice little uh um reminisce uh, well yeah it was nice to reminisce and and uh 
like I said, I, I was really blessed to, to meet so many wonderful people up there and, and being able to uh, work alongside of um, the leaders of the North and, and help them um, to spread their culture and once again, bring it into our school was, was just, it was just a really amazing experience for me. And, and um, uh, I'm just happy that I get a chance to, to share it with other people as well. So I think that's my, that's my shtick. That's, uh, that's me tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any more questions. And if, if people have to go, uh, I, it's past my bedtime, but I'll, I'm, I'm happy to stay up <laughs> a little bit later. Uh, if anybody has uh, any questions for me and, and you've been very patient with me and I, I sincerely do appreciate that. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, you know that uh, my heart will always be in Fort Kent. My heart will always be in uh, Arista County and my travels have taken me many places, but uh, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to go home again in the next uh, week or so here and and enjoy a, an American Thanksgiving that I haven't been able to do for a while and uh, see the good people of uh, the St. John Valley. Great. Anybody have any questions? My pleasure. Again. You did a great job, Lauren. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you. This it was a great was education. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. He was trained well. He was trained well. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, folks. Thank you again, Lauren. And uh, you, enjoy Lauren. your Thanksgiving. Yeah, I'll try. Thank you. I'll talk to you later, Mom. Jeff. Mom, Mom <laughs> knows how I like my gravy. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, too, Thank you, Lauren.